what I would like to do today, and I think this series is just really wonderfully uh, inspired and, and directed. We need to do more of this. And what I'd like to do today, I think take, um, taking uh, some direction from what Michelle had provided, I think in September when we exchanged some emails on this, is to tell you a little bit about the kinds of teaching that I'm involved with. So I'm going to take some uh, experiences that I have had from my lectures over the past roughly 25 years, uh, principally at the undergraduate level, uh, and tell you about some things that have worked in this. Now, one thing that I would say that reflects upon pretty much everything that Michelle mentioned in the introduction, and I'll get this out front, is that it's easy being a teacher when you have smart students. It's easy getting research done when you have smart students. So we have to understand where we're starting from, and that is I've been blessed over the years with an incredible research group, and we know the Stanford community just has an incredibly talented group of students. Uh, another thing I would like to get out, out front uh, in terms of what makes for good teaching, um, I think there is nothing more important than caring about the product, caring about the students. So there are a lot of different ways that we could talk about how we get from where we are to where we need to go. But I think it's uh, as simple as that. If you really care about the students, you're going to be very successful. And more importantly, the students will appreciate that. The best way of creating great teachers is to have students who compliment them. It's hard to come back to a lecture after you've been told Professor, I really enjoyed the way you did this. It's hard to come back to the next lecture without feeling that you want to do better to help them more. So there's a reward system that's involved that's, I think, very, very important to this process. And so what I do with my students right now, the introductory course that I have, and this is Introductory Organic Chemistry, it's 300 students packed into a 280-seat lecture hall. They're sitting in the aisles. As I tell them to pay attention to their teaching assistants. We have regular rounds of cheering our teaching assistants along. These teaching assistants are dedicated, but I think they're even more so after they hear from the students that they're doing well. When we do well on an exam, the teaching assistants know about it. Not only the students, but the teaching assistants know about it. So these are some of the things that I think are, are upfront in terms of what works uh, in the sciences. Now I'm going to continue, and, and this is probably true uh, across all disciplines in all educational experiences. You've had a chance, while well, this has been up here, to read the abstract that I, I, I provided some time ago. What I'm going to do here roughly is adhere to this outline. I'm told that we have about four hours to go through this material. <laughs> so I prepared a lot of slides to cover this. Uh, you laugh. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, this is one of the problems that I've had as a lecturer, is, is not knowing when the lecture is over. But we'll see what we could do today. So here's the outline. Here's our itinerary, what we hope to cover. I can't talk about things accurately myself without putting them in context. You can't talk about the experience of raisins and raisin bread without talking about baking and all of those kinds of things. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the context of science education, just so that we have calibration, so we could understand where we are right now and where we might want to go in, in, in the future. A little bit about teaching and learning and the importance of metrics, because I think a lot of stuff that we use when we evaluate teaching, teaching experiences, teaching methods and things of that type, it's kind of a touchy-feely kind of thing, but it doesn't have metrics. We need to introduce more metrics, more ways of measuring what we mean by success, and significantly better ways than the grading system, which I always have had problems with and will continue to have problems with. It's probably the best thing we could do for some purposes, but we should be able to try to do better. Then I'm going to talk about some serious stuff, and then I'm going to talk about some fun stuff, and then finally we're going to do something with the William Tell Overture. Okay, uh, as I've indicated here, I'm drawing this from experiences with the introductory course, and, and I will get around to some specific examples of what has worked in that course and what I think might have great carryover capability uh, with respect to other courses. So first of all, the obvious. 
I think everyone in this room has an interest in education, and, and you're all to be complimented for showing up at, at a seminar, at a lecture of this type, because that's the kind of spirit that's going to make for a better future. One of the most important things that we do on planet Earth is to educate the next generation, and it's great to see people like this coming together with that uh, shared mission. I think we all would agree that the requirements for success in education are that we have aptitude and experience. That is, people who know a subject. You need to know the subject to be able to teach. We have to have the right attitude. Those people have to share an attitude of wanting to help others to learn the subject. So we need people motivated to teach the subject. We need people motivated to learn the subject. Uh, we need to teach this and we need to worry about what and how we communicate. What we communicate, that is the course content, and how that content is transferred. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, some fun exercises that we might get to. Learning, what and how it is received, because this is, and the center is appropriately named, uh, this is not a one-sided experience. It's not teaching, it's not what's being sent, it's also what's being received, and the fidelity of the two, uh, the transmission and the reception process. And then the vision, how we're going to use this. So these, I think, are the requirements for success in education, irrespective of whether one is doing science or humanities or in the medical school or in the business school or wherever. Let me give you an example of what happens if any one of these things drops out. And I don't want to pick on France at this particular time, but a few years ago I happened to have a tour of most of the major research and teaching institutions in France. Uh, in a relatively short period of time. And I had the opportunity of meeting with many of the graduate students who were aspiring PhDs in the French educational system. Now, the French scientists are every bit as good as U.S. scientists. Their system is, is very similar in many ways right now to our own system. The course content, the materials that they teach, where they're headed, there's very, very close parallels to the U.S. system. But the thing that amazed me most is is the attitude of the students. The students were all, at that particular period of time, depressed. And why were they depressed? It's the vision thing. There basically weren't any job opportunities, any reward systems, any mechanisms for them to use their skill set after they got finished. So basically, they were staying on for a, an extra PhD or an extra year or a postdoctoral experience because there was nothing in the bigger world. And they weren't too excited about that. So if one drops out any one of these things, that impinges upon success, either compromising or, or completely uh, destroying uh, opportunities towards success. That's just one example. One could do that with every one of those uh, entries here. Very important. Uh, let me take you back, because sometimes understanding where we need to go requires that we understand where we are, and we all understand where we are, but to see the trajectory, we need to sometimes see where we started. All right, so roughly about 100 and some years ago, maybe about 120, 100 years ago, I find this absolutely remarkable as a scientist to think about this. U.S. was a developing country. We often operate only in the context of our contemporary experiences, our life span, or our experiential span. But if we take a broader view of civilization on planet Earth, we begin to see how things changed as a function of time. And this is rather remarkable. In the United States, we were 120, 130, 140 years ago, perceived globally, as well as by ourselves, as a developing country. Those seeking advanced degrees studied abroad. They studied abroad, PhD degrees, German. Uh, typically, if a student was going abroad, he or she would need to know German. So this was a requirement. And the vestige of that is still in the US educational system. The PhD program in many departments, at many institutions, will have a language requirement. This is a carryover from that time. And it's interesting, the languages that are required are German and French, typically. Uh, sometimes Russian, but basically the languages in the sciences will be the languages in which the literature of that time uh, were written, and therefore scholars in those fields needed to read that literature. We still carry on these requirements, and I think they're absolutely great, but not necessarily for scientific purposes, because now much of the literature, and in fact, much of the literature is in English, and I think most of planet Earth uh, has, has agreed that this will become, at least for the, the near term, uh, the language of scientific uh, exchange. But at that point in time, knowledge of German was required if you had aspirations of, of excellence in science. Germany, England, France dominated 
uh, global science at that period of time. U.S. was without a structure of higher education. So here's an audience participation question. When was the first Ph.D. granted in the United States? Any volunteers? That's a good one. All right, that's, yeah, the error bar in there is very small. Who said that? You did? Yeah, it's 1861. What subject? This is the bonus round. <laughs> what subject? Physics. Physics. No? That's, it, you know, I like answers. I don't care whether they're right or wrong. I just like answers. <laughs> yes? Botany. Botany. Hmm, that's an interesting one. Uh, no, that's not it. Interestingly enough, for those non-scientists in the audience, and I think we're all part of the same fabric, so I don't really make this distinction that sometimes we do humanities and sciences and things of that type. It's part of a continuum. But for the so-called non-scientists in, in the audience, it's interesting that the first degree was in 1861 in English. Okay? In English. Granted by uh, one of my alma maters, Yale University. First science degree in the United States. So English came first. First science degree. <laughs> Not quite, but it was a science degree that included chemistry, but it was in 1863 that we did that. So I, I find these things to be interesting. So you, go, you don't have to go back too far to a point in time where we simply didn't have a structure of higher education in this country. Uh, first PhD, 1861, science, 1863, from 1870 to 1879, Yale had seven PhDs in science, Johns Hopkins won, Harvard won, Michigan won, and Stanford didn't even exist, okay? <laughs> Pretty remarkable time, okay? Where are we now? Well, a lot of things have happened, and here was a transition period. It was Gilman, who was a Yale grad of the middle of the 19th century, who actually started a school of science at Yale. And this is where you need to start these things. You need a nucleation point to turn countries around, to turn people around, to turn our society, our civilization around. And this was one of those nucleating points. Gilman was a grad of 1852. 1852. He started the Yale School of Science. Interestingly enough, historically, I love this, he came out to um, head up the UC, the University of California system, all right? And, and we lost out, I would say. History would have been rewritten. We lost out on an opportunity because he left shortly after arriving here because the prospect of continued fierce political controversy was uninviting. Okay? <laughs> some things change, some things don't change. <laughs> 1875, he became the first president of Johns Hopkins that had a vision. Here's the vision part of what I mentioned at the outset. And one of the, one of the comments that has resonated with me for a long time since I first read about these historical uh, proceedings is this one. It's, it is scholars who make a college, not bricks and mortar. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. While we complain justifiably about facilities and equipment and all sorts of other things, the first point of emphasis should be the people who are involved in the institution. Everything else will follow in order if the climate is right. Okay, along comes then at Johns Hopkins, Ira Remsen. This is Ira Remsen here. He was appointed in 1876, so shortly after uh, Gilman, who had this vision, had created this vision at Yale, went to UC, came back to Johns Hopkins, basically saw the opportunity of moving things along, and appointed Ira Remsen, who was then a budding young professor at Williams College, a small liberal arts college, and I had the pleasure of visiting there just a few months ago, and one of my former PhD students, Tom Smith, is now on the faculty there. It's a great institution, and boy, do they have a real wonderful educational mission and spirit of, of abounding there. The students are just so incredibly excited about the, the faculty, about their research, about the teaching program, and so on and so forth, and as best I could determine, that was probably not unlike uh, what Ira Remsen was experiencing and leading when he was at Williams. But at any event, he was attracted by Gilman uh, to head up a science program at Johns Hopkins in 1876. He had no lab, he had only a handful of students, but he had a vision and support from the university. I'm going to come back to support a lot of times because I think that's also very important uh, uh, in our thoughts about higher education. 
from 1879. Remember the numbers up here. In a decade, we had 10 PhD degrees. From 1879 to 1913, 202 PhDs in chemistry came out of John Hopkins. That's absolutely remarkable, including one to E.C. Franklin, who was the mentor of Bergstrom. And you heard Michelle in her introduction mention the Bergstrom share, which I enjoy. It is this very Bergstrom uh, that's involved. And Bergstrom's student was Haber. And it was Haber who gave the university the money. And this is really an incredibly generous gesture of Charlie Haber, who now lives down the road a piece in Carmel Valley, to basically create a chair, not in his name, but in the name of his teacher, Francis Bergstrom. Absolutely remarkable. So you see one person created much of what we think about in terms of the, the order of some of the physical sciences, certainly some of the chemistry, and that's what I'm focusing on in this country as we know it now. So one person or a small group of people can have a huge difference if put in the right environment. I should mention that, that Remsen, whose picture you see here, was not only, he, he went on to become the second president of Johns Hopkins, but it was also the discoverer of saccharin, so something that you are obviously <coughs> familiar with if you've tasted artificial sweeteners, either saccharin or many of the derivatives of saccharin that are now used uh, for that purpose. All right, let's see where we are now. Interestingly enough, in a little over 120, 130 years, we are now the world leader in most areas of science. Those seeking advanced degrees study here. Many of the students in my group, many of the students in other groups of comparable size and, and uh, direction have many people from other countries participating in our research, participating in our teaching. Knowledge of English is now required, a knowledge of English. So when I travel, as I did, I, we spent the month of September as a visiting professor in Paris. It's interesting, many of the students there are learning English so that they could spend some time studying whatever in the United States. If you go to J Japan, you'll find the same thing. In many other countries, this would also be true. Most countries right now lag behind the US in a variety of ways, not only the economy, but also in their educational structure and the effectiveness of their system. And we can touch upon that. There are many markers of this that I could share with you. That's not a pejorative comment about these countries. It simply is a fact of the US taking the initiative to do things and getting uh, results as, 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 as a consequence of that. US has a structure of higher education. And right now in chemistry, if we like these metrics, we're producing about 2,000 PhD degrees per year. It's incredible. And they are driving the economy. They are driving our, our import-export balances. Chemistry is enjoying tremendous success in that regard. And they are powering up a whole lot of the other disciplines that rely on chemistry, this molecular vision of the world. Uh, to move forward into the 21st century. So that's where we are now. Our system works. Now, why does it work? Well, I've touched a little bit upon that, but partly we get proper support. You'll notice, again, I put proper in quotation marks. All right, we're doing much better than, than some of our cohort group is doing, but we should be doing even better than that. There's a free flow of information. Most scientists would agree, most teachers would agree that this has helped us move from where we were 120, 130 years ago to where we are now. There's a free flow of people, and this dramatically contrasts what goes on in educational experiences in other countries, where typically students stay within a system. They do their undergraduate training at, at an institution. They do their postgraduate, undergraduate training at the institution. They become members of the faculty at that institution. They don't move far beyond where they started. I have a coworker who's uh, on the faculty at the University of Santiago in Spain. It was a big, big move for him because he had to move about 50 miles uh, up the road from his hometown. And his family just didn't understand that. Okay, he's 50 miles away from home. This concept of, you know, for example, I was raised on the East Coast, so 3,000 miles away, 2,500 miles away. This is common in the United States, but in many other countries, this movement away from one's hometown, home institution, is, is not typical. We did not have that situation in the United States. Another thing that one finds historians commenting on quite frequently is that we have a much more entrepreneurial attitude about science and about education in general. And it's no accident, for example, that Stanford uh, provides some leadership in that regard. It's no accident that the campus is lined by one of the highest concentration of venture capitalists in the United States. About a third of the venture capital funding comes from Sand Hill Road, uh, for those of you who follow that. That was at least true in the past. 
uh, pre-year 2000. Clearly, they've dropped down now, but probably percentage-wise, they're close to that. Okay, what about support, uh, proper support? Well, some of this is a consequence of the U.S. government and foundations getting involved in higher education and in research. So foundations have contributed, the government has contributed. This has made a difference in terms of our approach to science. We should be doing more, however. If you were to think about this as a family, you would probably put education as the highest priority in your budget. This has not been the case in this country. It has not been the case in a lot of other countries. We need to get closer to that. For example, just to give you metrics, I like these things, and I don't want to dump on the Defense Department, but for example, all of chemistry that's supported by the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health, all of it, in a given year, at all institutions, all research groups, what number would you think about? All of chemistry research. NSF, NIH. In the billions? I wish. <laughs> I wish. It turns out, this, this is why it's important to think about these things, because we don't think about them, and therefore we can't use our judgment in helping to change things if we don't have measurements of them. But roughly, it's somewhere around 300 to 400 million dollars. Now, for calibration, that's about a wing of a stealth bomber, okay? So if we have, they're coming off the conveyor belt at a clip of about 2.3 billion and change. Uh, so if we had that, you could imagine doing a lot. Now that's just one discipline, there are a lot of other things. But 300 to 400 million dollars is a lot of money. There's no doubt about it. But think about how we're using that. Think about how that's driving the economy and driving the quality of life. If we didn't have an investment in science and technology, much of life as we know it wouldn't exist. It's as simple as that. Our colleague Paul Ehrlich will tell you that we're on a 14 terawatt planet or something of that type. You pull the plug immediately. Within days, we're going to have major problems because of the absence of science and technology that's now supporting simple things like just food distribution. If you didn't have the means to distribute the food, there would be mass problems uh, on the planet. So uh, other things that contribute to this is we encourage people and, and ideas. And this is a little bit different than some other systems. For example, in Japan, they have a COSA system, which is basically a pyramid system, on top of which there would be the professor. By the time a person gets into that position, he is typically 40-ish, 50-ish, and has only a few years left in his career, and then basically he's tied up with administrative work. The US system, I think, is much better because immediately we appoint people as assistant professors and say, go for it. Okay, now it has a downside because we don't have a support structure for that. We put them in a classroom without giving them prior training of what they're going to be doing in the classroom, and they try their best. They eclectically pick up on this, that, and the other thing, but they don't always succeed. But nevertheless, we give people the opportunity to excel. We don't necessarily put them into another lab where they are under the influence of someone else who's going to decide what they do and what they think about. So I think that's been one of the advantages of our system. Where are we now? Well, if we were to grade on a curve, we'd say we're doing pretty well, all right? And we often hear about grading on a curve, but I would like to say if we grade on an absolute scale, we need to do much better, and we can do much better. And let me just give you an example of what I mean by that. I was on the National Science, uh, not National Science Foundation Advisory Board about 10 years ago when the liaison uh, person for the Secretary of Education came to one of our meetings to present, as was the case for all of these meetings, a kind of synopsis of the national state of education. And usually these presentations are all pie charts and bar graphs, Washingtonese, you always get these. Uh, but on this occasion, they decided to do a video. And the video was actually the commencement of Harvard University for the undergraduates uh, receiving their degree. And the video came in with the logo of Harvard University, and then that dissolved away. We saw the proud parents beaming in the audience, and then we saw the students, you know, this really smiling and enthusiastic. Post-graduation uh, ceremony, uh, members of this group uh, interviewed the students as they were leaving the commencement. And they wanted to just know where the, these students who are representative of the products of higher education, of our colleges and universities, where they were with some understanding of fundamental things in our world. This is not necessarily something that you'd get out of a class. It's just out of curiosity, maybe, maybe uh, supplemented with some discussions with others, with professors, and what have you. And so the question was a simple one. 
and I'll pre present it to you here. Why is it hot in the summer and cold in the winter? What was absolutely amazing is that two-thirds of the Harvard undergraduates got that wrong. Okay? Got that wrong. Now, I don't <laughs> want to pick on Harvard. They are representative of a K through 12 problem that is not helped much by some of the things that go on in the, in the post-12 uh, period. What was amusing about that, if there's anything amusing about two-thirds of the students not getting something as fundamental as why the seasons are the way they are, uh, is that some of them took on the mannerisms of the professors who trained them. And, and you'll have to get this tape at one point in time, but it was absolutely beautiful because this one person was clearly an expert in doublespeak. He just went on when asked to provide an explanation. He just went on, and he sounded so intelligent and so insightful, and he had all the right buzzwords and buttons and pushing and this and that. And he's gesticulating, just like someone you would expect to see in front of a lecture room that might not be presenting what he should be presenting, but has a lot of hot air to release. And the student went on just like that, just like that for the better part of five minutes. And one was thinking, oh my goodness, <laughs> where are we going? All right, so the answer to the question, I'm not going to uh, uh, put you on the spot here and, and do a sampling. The answer to the question is the tilting of the Earth's axis. It's not, you know, as, as some students would say, well, here's the sun, here's the sun, and during the summer, the Earth is really close to the sun, and during the winter, it's really far away from the sun. No, it's not that. It's the tilting of the Earth's axis, okay? So we got that one right. Uh, clearly, we need to do more. So K through 12 will influence what we do post-12 uh, in our environment. <coughs> Uh, what's required for further success? Well, we need to continue to do the things that I told you at the outset. That's very important. But there are areas of tremendous opportunity. And these are things that I've been worrying about. And these are not things that you will necessarily find in books. Some of them you might find. Some of them uh, are probably things that you've thought about, too, as well. One of the things that I've been pushing a lot of, and I think we need to have a serious discussion about this, is the importance of integrated education. The institution of higher education is probably one of the world's longest existing institutions. All right, arguably it started uh, maybe about, uh, let's say, 1,500, 1,600 years ago, if we trace it back in time. And it hasn't changed much since the beginning. It has kept centers of pure disciplinary activity together. So I'm in the Department of Chemistry. Does that mean I can't think biological thought? Okay, or I can't do research that impacts funded area. The problems of the world are not purely chemistry. They're not purely biology. They're not even purely science. Many of the things in science relate to law. They relate to business. We started a program on drug design in the medical school 10 years ago. Most of the students were from the medical school and from humanities and sciences. But interestingly enough, we had students from the business school and we had students from the law school. And of course, business school students and law school students would want to know about the future of drug design because that's a big employer in this country and it's a, it has a big and important product for us all. But to approach these things, we need to do more integration. We need to bring programs together, cross-disciplinary activities that are part of the educational process, not just part of the research process. And I don't want to differentiate between research and education. They're both part of the same fabric. But in the classroom, we need to bring in more of these experiences when we talk about chemistry, we have to frame it in the context of medicine, frame it in the context of biology, frame it in the context of literature, and so on and so forth. Uh, QCB is a quantitative chemical biology program. It's a fusion program that we started literally last year, and, and the uh, university has picked up and is supporting this program right now, Daria Mosley Rosen and myself. We need to bring people off campus. This is another thing that I think we're missing out on. I think it's rather remarkable that we academicians think that we're the only ones who could train the future people on the planet. There's a whole lot of talent and insight in industry off campus. And there's a whole lot of synergy that could come out of forming closer relationships with our industrial colleagues in the educational area, in, in the research area, and in many other areas. Motivation and information transfer is, is a very important part of teaching. Historically in the sciences, it was principally information transfer. I think we now need to put information into the context of motivation. That is, what are we going to use this for? What is it important for? What are the big problems of our time? Proper incorporation of technology in the classroom, computers and things of that type. This is huge. This is huge. We've got to do more of this because it's actually critical to understanding many areas. Science education as a science 
not just as some touchy-feely kind of thing where we have a pseudo-subjective evaluation or pseudo-objective evaluation, but we need to get more involved with how to measure success uh, in the sciences. Future-driven rather than past-driven. Educational systems, as is true for any system of thought, has an inertial problem. It has to get out of the past, train for the future. We need to think where we're going and align science toward those particular goals, not simply continue to do things because it worked in the past. A lot of us work that way. Uh, some attitudinal adjustments are going to be valuable, and probably the most important thing, which I tell all of my introductory organic students, is that they're here for an education not a grade. The first time I said that, I did it rather uh, gently because I thought there would be a, a wholesale riot that ensued. And what I was, what I was struck with, here's, here's a class of over 300 students. They actually applauded that. You know, they really do understand that they want to get away from this business of, will this be on the exam? Will this be on the exam? Will this be on the exam? That's not what we need to be worrying about. The real question is, what's going to be on in life? How do we train these people for their careers and, and activities after they leave us here? OK, so what I'm going to do now is to tell you about some of the things related to how we, how in the context of organic chemistry, we get to doing, uh, get toward uh, achieving those ends. Here's a wonderful uh, quote from an article that's uh, worthwhile reading on this subject. Learning is not a spectator sport. One needs to get involved. Students do not learn by just sitting in a class, listening to teachers, memorizing prepackaged assignments, and spitting out answers. They must talk about what they are learning, write about it, relate it to past experiences, apply it to daily life. They must make what they learn part of themselves. And boy, if you could do that, you're going to be successful with any discipline. I would add to that that teaching is not a spectator sport. Teaching is a contact sport. Uh, we need to get involved. It requires interaction. It should have both motivational and information content. It requires connections. We need to connect. We need to establish neural networks of information, not just around a pure dis disciplinary subject, but along a lot of things that people think about. It requires innovation. It requires technology. It requires serious support. Serious support. It requires vision. It ultimately, as I mentioned before, its success is ultimately a function of caring and commitment. I see some of my students here, I really want them to succeed, okay? I really care about them. It's not just because they're in the room. I'm selfish. I'm selfish. When they're successful, I'm going to feel good. That's just the way the system works. There's nothing that makes me happier than to get a note from someone, one of my former students, about some of his or her success. It's a lot of fun. So I'm self-driven selfishly in that regard. What works? Now I'm going to tell you about some things that work for me. So these are some specific things that might relate to some things that you might do. We need better systems of evaluation. The grade system works, but it doesn't work as well as it should. And I'm going to tell you about a grade-based system, but it allows us to deal with things in a, little bit, uh, in a little bit different manner than is typically the case. And it grew out of an experience that I had when I was associated with the course at Harvard, but I was not responsible for that course. I was basically just sitting in on it, watching a senior professor provide a <coughs> presentation. So a kind of mentoring experience at that time. Uh, then we had an exam. And it was about 10 minutes into the exam when a student in this course basically just, in the jargon of the time, wigged out. And literally, we had to take that student to, uh, to the clinic, where he basically, you know, he was put on a couch and had to, we had to calm him down and all of that kind of stuff. And I realized there that this is not really a system that works. That's obviously only one student out of many, but it convinced me that there, before I have an exam in my course, I usually put this up in front of my lecture hall as a for example. Okay. Because I'm told that animals have a calming experience. <laughs> And we're not allowed to bring much into the room, but this is about as close in appearance to my cat as you'll find. This is Ralph, and, and believe me, it, it, I think it helps. Okay. So there are these kinds of things that we could do. But here's another thing, because I think what happened with that student and what happens with many of our students is that they get over-anxious about a grade. And why do they get anxious? Because they're worrying, in essence, they're, they're not aware of a rate of learning problem. We all learn at different rates. 
We all learn at different rates. So here's how you beat that problem. And we don't adopt this widely, even at this university. I've been using it here for over 20 years. And I'll tell you, the evaluations I get from students, this is one of the things that they really rave about. OK, we're plotting here increasing knowledge against increasing time. This line right here is the A level understanding. This line right here is the C level. The red curve corresponds to some students who pick up on material quickly, the blue to those who pick up on material slowly. Notice, at the end of the course, they're at the same point. But yet, our grading system would disfavor the blue curve students over the red curve students. They're above the A line at the very beginning. They're above the A line at the next exam, at the next exam, at the final. The blue people just get it more slowly. Okay? They're not as quick, but they get it. They get it, and that's what we're about, making sure that they get it by the end of the course. So what we do here is we have a plan A and a plan B program. We give three-hour exams. They could drop any one of the three. We don't care when they drop it. They could go to San Francisco on that day. They drop it. They don't have to worry about it. They'll have a legitimate or a non-legitimate excuse. We could care less. It's their prerogative to either use it as a chance to get a grade or not. We only want two of those. And we'll count that with the final. So for the plan A students, they take two exams, any two, uh, three exams, only two count. The exams will count for 55% of their grade. The final will count for 35% of the grade. Those students who are slower in picking up on the material for any one of a number of reasons, maybe they have more extracurricular activities at the beginning of the course than they have at the end. So they don't have time to study. They're at the C level when exam one comes around, they're going to get killed on that exam. They do a little bit better by exam two, and they're up into the A level by exam three, but they would be messed up by the plan one strict program. So what we do for them is we have any two exams count, but now the hour exams only count for 35% of the grade, the final for 55%. So the point being, we don't care when they get it just as long as they get it. Now there's another thing that's important here. If you look at this curve and you worry about metrics, you'll notice a decay. We have to worry about that. Uh, Post-curve decay. <laughs> we have to do something to improve upon that. And that's, this is why getting an education, not a grade, is important because you could cram for the grade, maybe hit it, and then this thing falls off precipitously and you come back in September and you don't have a clue about what you're doing in chemistry because the first course went by. Yes, question. Um, do they get to choose later after they've taken all the exams or do they have to choose right up front what they We give them, we use a computer to give them the best grade. Okay, so it's a forgiving system. You know, if they don't do well on the first exam, I tell them, and, and they love it. It's, it's equivalent to the cat. That, you know, they say, don't worry about it. Throw that exam away. Do better on the next exam. They don't do well on the second exam. Are they in trouble? No, the second exam only counts for 18% of their total grade. They still have about 70% of their total grade to earn, even after they take the second exam. So we're right here. We have one exam left in a final. 80% of their grade could be determined in the final few weeks of the course if they get it then. If they don't get it, then obviously we will know that they didn't get it and we'll make the appropriate recommendations on what they should do or where they might track uh, as a function of that. But it, it really works. This works. The students love it. <coughs> I love it because I could get away from these anxiety problems with that and we focus, focus, focus more on education rather than on grade. Love it for that reason. The discussions are about how do I make this carbon carbon bond or how do I do that rather than on, will this be on the exam? Will this be on the exam? Okay, here to get an education, not a grade. Uh, motivation and accountability. Uh, we're running out of time, so I'm going to be a little quick about this, but it's important to have structure. Here's the structure that I have in Chem 33. This is not unlike many other courses. We have students. The students are accountable to the TAs. The TA is accountable to the head TA. Travis Williams, who's standing by the door, is the current head TA in the course that I have. And the head TA, Travis, is accountable to me. It's important to have that structure. And when I present this in class to a group of 300, I always present it in a way that begs the next question. Who are you accountable to? <laughs> and I point out to them that ultimately, I'm accountable to them. Because we're all getting older, and about 70, 80% of the students in my course are pre-med. And at some point in the future, I'm going to need their skills. <laughs> and so it's in my best interest to make sure that they get the best possible education out of this. 
And so I mentioned this at Harvard when I started teaching at Harvard. Came out to Stanford a few years later. And I was running marathons at that time and doing a lot of long distance running without properly hydrating myself. And I ran into a kidney problem that required emergency surgery. I was put into the Stanford Hospital. And Dr. Freeha, the surgeon, asked if I would be willing to do a demo because he had a new way of getting at kidneys. <laughs> I said, all right, I'm a scientist. I like experiments and I like demos. I'm a teacher. So yeah, let's go for it. He said he's going to bring around eight residents. Uh, so that he could tell them about the procedure. And on a given afternoon, he came in to my office, or into the, uh, the, the bed that I was in, <coughs> that area that I was in, and said, I'm going to bring these students in. Are you ready for it? I said, sure, absolutely. Just make sure you put a big L and a big R on my back so we have that down. And then he pulls back the curtain, and I will remember forever what I heard then. Professor Wender. <laughs> to which my response was, what was your grade? <laughs> a student from my undergraduate course at Harvard was now a resident at Stanford. Absolutely remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. So there is this business of accountability. Now, there are a lot of other things that go on. Here's the educational process, another way of thinking about it. I like to think about it this way. We start from ignorance. And that decreases as a function of time because we ask questions, we make observations, I should say, which create information. The information, as we ponder it, because we're intrinsically curious people, creates knowledge, and need creates value. So this is a way of thinking about the educational process that I like. It breaks it down to its four uh, components, if you will. We start off here, we acquire information, and information is different from knowledge. Knowledge is putting the information together. Uh, value then comes from the application of that knowledge to need. Birds fly. How do they fly? When we learn how that happens, then we can create commercial aviation uh, out of that. It's as simple as that. That's education. Let's look at how this works in the real world. Uh, do you recognize what these are? Chilies, okay? And there are two types. This, if you could see this well, it's a little bit dim because of the contrast. This is a jalapeno. Okay, and this is habanero. Okay, so these are actually measured. You could, it's interesting that we can measure the heat content of a chili pepper, but we can't measure the educational content of a lecture. It's interesting, okay? But these are measured in international Scoville units, which actually measure the amount of capsaicin, which is the active ingredient in chili peppers. So I want you all as scientists now to come with me to Armadillo Willies where they serve an intensely hot salsa, okay? This is a four chili pepper in the margin type. You need a doctor's release to get this, okay? You dip a chip in it, what do you see? The very first thing that happens, you're looking across the table, someone takes some of the salsa, they eat it, you see the most intense expression of human pain registered on this person's face. Okay, what happens next? After groping around, crying, losing one's voice, grabbing a beer or water or whatever you could get your hands on. It's interesting. What happens next? You take another chip with salsa. This just doesn't make sense. And then you put this on a, on a clock and you see the chips going down, the salsa going down faster as a function of time. So we're, we are creating information. We're making some observations. Now here's the knowledge. Um, in uh, the capsaicin, the active ingredient of chili pepper is actually a, an irritant, a very powerful irritant, but it has another interesting activity. After a period of time, it's an analgesic agent, a pain suppressing agent. So it's a delayed analgesic. So here's now where you can become creative. You have the knowledge now of what chili peppers do. You could create products of value. If you have tennis elbow, you could rub some chili peppers on your elbow and the pain will go away. And that is indeed the case. So this particular medication is just chili pepper in mineral oil. Here's capsaicin, basically just capsicum, chili pepper extract in another mineral oil. If you want to stop the predation and damage done by large animals in Africa, you could use this knowledge. How would you do that? Okay, so we're going information, observation, knowledge, value. And now the challenge to you all, and this is not a chemical problem, you have all the information, we want to stop these elephants and large animals from walking through hedges and what have you that are protecting villages in Zimbabwe. How do we do that? Yeah, isn't it great? Okay, 
Right. So you know, you're in chemical research now. And you're creating <laughs> products of value. Yeah, you know, or they go out for a bag of chips. <laughs> What happens is you just slather this on these weakly defensive uh, shrubs, and as the animals pass through, they get some of it on their coat or skin, and the very first thing that most animals will do is to lick it. They're going to have the salsa uh, chili pepper uh, experience, and it's a wonderful appetite suppressant when it's really powerful stuff. Not the stuff that you get at armadillo willies. You could, you could actually fire this up a higher notch. The animals lose track of what they're doing and they basically get off and run. But they're totally distracted from their original mission, which is coming in and foraging for food. So there it is. This came out of, this is actually part of a seminar uh, on, on Society of Conservation Biology for Zimbabwe uh, meeting in July 2002. Okay, oh geez, we're running out of time. Here we are, and I'm only in the first hour. We have three more to go though. <laughs> I have so many things to tell you, I'm going to scroll through this very rapidly, and, and the reason why I'm going to do this now is because I'd like you, I'd just like to touch those of you who might have an interest in what works, and then we're going to go to the William Tell Overture to finish this. But what you're looking at right now is a view of how our brains work, okay? So what I told you right now is what the educational process is all about, and our brains work, and this is important that we understand the mechanics, if you will, of how the brain works, because this is what we're trying to do when we teach. So we send information out, advanced observations, instructions. So this is the information that we're talking about. We all have filters. So as students, we filter this information in a variety of ways. We then interpret it, rearrange it, and process it for storing it into long-term memory. So this is kind of the active uh, memory. Uh, what would that be, Gabe? RAM yeah. type of capabilities? OK, so this would be the RAM space, the working space. When we think about it, this is, what, this is the hard drive, the hard disk, uh, where we store it, we retrieve it. There are feedback loops. And remember, this relates to what I just told you. The learning process is looking, observing, creating information. With information, we create knowledge. With knowledge, we create things of value. This is how we process things. This is how we make those information. This is how we make those observations, how we process the observations. And let me give you an example of how perception influences learning, how perception influences learning. What do you see? Not chemistry. My human, torso. My human torso. Good. I love answers. Don't care whether they're right or wrong. Answers. What do you see? A zebra face. Okay. I love it. What else? Perception influencing what we learn. I love this. Gateway box. <laughs> that kind of looks like that. That's good. <laughs> what else? Panda bear. We are biased in our learning is the message here. We are biased in our learning and we as educators need to understand those biases so we can help. I'm going to take that structure and turn it upside down. Oh, yeah. Okay. Isn't that amazing? It's a cat. It's a cat with flappy ears. But isn't, isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing how biased we are in, in our learning process? We need to think about this when we present material. All right, in addition to the perceptual filter, we have a working space, and here's a big revelation, I think, to a lot of educators who don't think about the metrics and mechanics of the educational process. It has finite capacity. Our intellectual working space has finite capacity. And let me show you an example of that. 17th March, okay? What I'd like you to do is to take the numbers in 17th March and order them in increasing value. Got it? Shoot up your hand if you have the answer. 137, okay? 137. So 17, 3, March being the third month, and then you just put 3 in increasing order, you get 137, okay? Now, some of you might have gotten to the point that this gentleman got to. Some of you might not have in that period of time. Remember, rate of learning is important. 23rd October, do the same thing. 0123, okay? Some of you are getting it there quickly. Some maybe not. 15th April, 89. Good. 26 September 1987. 
I love it. I love it. You're, you're holding your hands up to your forehead and rubbing it. <laughs> the capacity is being exceeded. <laughs> this is it. When, it's, when you start to feel the pain, you're getting close to the capacity. Okay, we all have it. You might have been there for that one. It's a one, two, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, and try for another one. Okay. And Okay, <laughs> you've suffered enough. The point that I'm trying to make is you saw how this slowed down as you put more and more information into the working space. So there is a finite capacity that we have to comprehend something in our random access memory. When we're presenting lectures, we can't overload it because it will just be lost. It'll go through the student, it'll bounce off, they won't be able to pick it up because it's not put in in a unit that they could actually process effectively. So this is hugely important that we understand that we do have a finite capacity. Now this is not just my saying so. I've been able to collect some studies on this that, are, that, that uh, bear on this. The number of students answering correctly as a function of the complexity of the question, there's a precipitous drop off in this curve. So this is basically the capacity. If you start putting out lecture information that's more complex than this, most of your students just won't get it. They just won't get it. You might be sending it, but they don't have the working space capacity. And what's importantly is the capacity is limited. We can't change that. There's no way of doing this right now. But we could change the efficiency which, which, with which we use this. Uh, just to run through this now, we learn by first principles and by analogy. Most of us are not abstract thinkers, so we need contextual types of learning, relational types of learning. We need context. So one of the very, very strong recommendations that I would make to anyone who cares about helping students to get it is put in as many contexts for a learning experience as is possible. Connect it to things. Analogies work. This is the structure. Here's the chemistry part of it. <laughs> Here's the structure of methane, carbon connected to four atoms. It could be arranged in a tetrahedron. That is where the hydrogens are at the corner of a tetrahedron, or those hydrogens could be arranged in a square planar form, such that the hydrogens are at the corner of a square, which is the preferred structure. Make it easy on the students. Here is, here is square planar methane. Okay, that's the structure that you see over here. Square planar methane. Square planar methane. Is this the preferred geometry for methane? Watch this, okay? You see. Okay. Pretty remarkable. And there's no way of hitting that where it's going to go to square planar. So a tetrahedral array, you could figure this out mathematically, by the way. But I think a whole lot <laughs> more people, a whole lot more students get it when I throw this up into the air and it comes down on a table in a pyramidal array, a tetrahedral array. Use technology. I don't have time to do this right now, but I was going to show you how we could go from methane up to drug delivery, just like that. Do the students love this? You know, they heard a lot about hydrocarbons and oil and water not mixing and things like that. If we connect it, though, to a therapeutic drug that has difficulty getting through a lipid bilayer of a cell into the cytoplasm, suddenly I have a whole crowd around me at the end of lecture saying, how is that done? How do you do it? Et cetera, et cetera. That's the way it should be. Connections. Carbon could be chiral. Its mirror image is non-superimposable on it. Connections to literature. This is actually the basis for through the looking glass. So that's why I don't think of science and humanities as being separated. They're one and the same. They're entrepreneurial, creative activities of expanding our base of knowledge. Uh, the very things that were talked about in Through the Looking Glass are things that were in science, being discussed in scientific circles uh, at the time. Uh, technology works. Use that whenever possible. This shows a mirror image structure. That's the mirror that we're twisting around. And we're going to show that the mirror image of something 
is not superimposable on it if that something has chirality. And you know that because if you were to take a bottle in your right hand and stand in front of a mirror, your mirror image would be holding it in what hand? What hand? Left hand. So you are not superimposable on your mirror image. And that's what we're seeing here, showing that structures can have handedness. And now I'm going to show you maybe if this works. This is wonderful. Using technology. So here's a, um, a reaction. And you're seeing a cyclic compound coming together with another cyclic compound. And they're forming bonds. This is great because we're showing motion in this. And they're going on to produce the product right there. Now let me show you. We learn the more senses we could put into the learning experience, the more powerful the experience. The longer it's going to be retained, the better we could deal with that decay curve. So get all of the senses engaged. It's a perceptual sport, OK? Not only the eyes and the ears, taste, sound, whatever you could do. You saw that reaction. Now I'm going to run it with sound. <laughs> Swedish chef, for those of you who might not recognize it. <laughs> it's hard to keep a straight face. You, know, it's, you, you just you have to love this stuff. And you know, students will see that, they'll remember that reaction. They'll ask me to play it time and time again. They're getting the chemistry, but they're also getting this other part that makes it just a wonderful learning experience. Uh, introducing subject. Here's NMR. Here's one of my lecture notes on NMR spectroscopy. Here's another of my lecture notes on NMR spectroscopy. If I were to present these things, I would get, I would the students would register interest at one level. But I precede these notes with this. It relates to magnetic resonance imaging. Look at these structures. We're looking right into a living human being. There are the eye sockets. Here's a cross section. We're seeing the esophagus. Here's the top part where we're doing a Z cut, and there's basically the lower dentures of this individual. There's the brain in incredible detail. One wants to learn about that subject now. It's not clear to me that one would have had the same motivation if this were your first slide in that lecture. So the intro, here's the, a, a, a rat embryo vasculature done by NMR. Here's the whole body. There's the machine that's used. And I'm just going, here's, here's a curiosity. It's wonderful. Stare at this for, for 10 seconds, 10 seconds. Okay, focus on that little red dot there. Keep focused. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? It's all chemistry, of course. Okay? <laughs> it's all chemistry. Get people to be teachers. This is wonderful, and I'll have to come back here because he has some prospective parents or people who are being entertained by the development office who would like to come by and see what's happening in chemistry these days. Okay? Now that's pretty interesting. And we're just doing chemistry. The whole thing has to do with rates of reaction. Rates of reaction. And so I'm going to need, we're going to need six participants, seven participants for this. And maybe it would be easiest if some of you could just come forward. You're going to be honorary chemists for this particular exercise. And the rest of you could situate yourself so that you could see these solutions. And Travis Williams is a graduate student in my group. And as I mentioned before, he's the head teaching assistant. And if you could look at the screen, so if you could stand on either side of the screen, I'm going to tell you what this experiment is about. Uh, curiosity, more things about curiosity. Why, when we're served fr fish, do we always get that wedge of lemon? OK, if there's, if there's truth in advertising, what's behind a whiter than white wash? Why are carrots orange? I love this. I put this out in front of my class this year. 
And there are at least a handful of students who are writing me emails all the time. They're talking with their parents. Their parents are saying, well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. They're probably having the most meaningful discussions with their parents that they've had in a long time, <laughs> talking about why carrots are orange. Why do snakes have forked tongues? Why can't we tickle ourselves? Why can't we make ourselves laugh? And what makes Teflon stick? Nothing sticks to Teflon, but it's in the pan. How does it stick to the pan? Inquiring minds want to know. Peak a person's curiosity. OK, here's the last one, what Travis is going to do. Uh, here's the simple way of thinking about this. We're going to be talking about rates. Another way of thinking about this is timing is important in life as well as in therapy. If one is sick, one might look like that. You might take a drug in a tablet. And if timing works, if that pill can make it through a whole lot of interesting chemical processes that have various times, then benefit will start right there, and we might look like that. So I want you to keep this in mind as Travis now does this. I'm going to talk over him so you can get everybody clustered around there. So I want you to keep this in mind. You can tell them that while I tell the rest of you about the context of this experience. This is done in front of a lecture hall, a lecture hall that has standing room only. <coughs> Students are in the aisles. They're seated. They're doing not unlike what you're doing. Don't pour it yet. Don't pour it yet. Wait, wait until the queue. Wait until the queue. Okay, A goes into B. You're going to hear a trumpet stand. But not yet. Here I'm going to yell dumb. So don't do it until he yells dumb. Are you ready? Okay. Now you see they're clear, colorless solutions to start off with. This is our lab experiment for today. Not yet. Stand by. <laughs> and remember, the pill going down, the esophagus, into the stomach, into the gastrointestinal tract, absorbed into the system, across the lipid bilayer. Ready to go? Stand by. Three, two, one, go. Pour quickly. There you go. Okay, now everyone can back up and look. Okay. Okay. So there's the first of these. So some, you know, some people don't get well. <laughs> but imagine this. This was a weak solution that we brought up today. Imagine this and that hitting, it's starting to go right now, hitting on exactly the last note. So we do this. Uh, we had to scramble last night to get this stuff together. But imagine a lecture hall with 300 people, and on the very last note, it goes to this dark purple color. Very last note. Absolutely amazing. These people want to know. It's curiosity again. They come back. They really want to know how this happens. But you saw the choreography was at least there. Everything went in sequence. It's been great talking with you. Thank you.